into some of the drawbacks of each of the five methods of, the, of apportionment that we've studied. One of the most basic ways to judge the fairness of an apportionment method is by the quota rule. The quota rule says that an apportionment method should give each state no fewer than its lower quota and no more than its upper quota. For example, if a state's standard quota or their exact fair share of seats is 138.29, then the only fair thing is to give that state either 138 or 139 seats. If we give fewer than 138, we call that a lower quota violation. And if you give more than 139, we call that an upper quota violation. Can Hamilton's method, method ever violate the quota rule? No, because think about the way Hamilton's method works. Every state, we calculate their exact fair shares and then round them down. So every state gets at least its lower quota. And then some states get one of the surplus seats, giving them their upper quota. So no, every state gets at least the lower quota. Some get their upper quota, right? But no one gets less than their lower quota. No one gets more than their upper quota. So let's look at um, what happens with the Congress of Peridor with Jefferson's method in light of the quota rule. So we already did this all out um, in a previous lesson. Um, and I just want to look at the results for state B, right? Look at their standard quota, their exact fair share versus how many seats they were awarded. Okay. Their standard quota is 138.72. So according to the quota rule, they should be awarded 138 or 139 seats. That would be the only two fair things to give them. But we gave them 140. So we have an upper quota violation here. We went higher than the upper quota. And it turns out that Jefferson's method can sometimes produce upper quota violations. And even worse, those violations consistently favor large states. That is a big drawback. And the problem came to light in 1832 in one of the most heated apportionment debates of US history. Using Jefferson's method, New York's standard quota was 38.59 seats. However, they were given 40 seats. Um, and that was the last year that Jefferson's method was used due to questions of constitutionality. Adams and Webster's method were both developed in response to this 1832 failure of Jefferson's method. So let's look at Adams' method. Um, how, did, how does Adams' method handle this same Congress of Peridor example? Again, let's look at state B. Standard quota versus how many seats they were awarded. So their standard quota is 138.72, and according to the quota rule, the only fair number of seats to give them would be 138 or 139, but we only gave them 137. So this is a lower quota violation. And it turns out that Adam's method does sometimes produce lower quota violations, and even worse, those violations consistently favor smaller states. So we can, con can conclude that Adams' method is no better or worse than Jefferson's, it's just a different kind of problem. And um, historically, after considerable debate, the apportionment bill based on Adams' method never passed. Um, and Adams' method was never used to apportion the House of Representatives. So let's look at Webster's method um, for the Peridor example. Is it any better than Jefferson's or Adams? So I'm going to check all the standard quotas versus the seats that were awarded. No violation here. No violation here. No violation. No violation. No violation. No violation. Okay, so no violations of the quota rule in this example. That doesn't mean that it can never happen, but it does mean that they're rarer. So Webster's method tends to produce apportionments that are pretty close to the standard quotas. 
It does occasionally produce quota violations on both sides, upper and lower, but they at least show no bias between large and small states. They're just more random. Surprisingly, Webster's method was pretty short-lived in the House of Representatives. It was replaced after 1931 with the method we currently use, Huntington Hill, which, as we discussed last class, is very similar to Webster's method. It just has a different rounding rule, slightly different rounding rule. So given how similar they are to each other, it's no surprise that its um, pros and cons are similar, right? It does produce apportionments pretty close to standard quotas, but occasionally will produce quota violations upper and lower, showing no bias between large and small states. So it appears that of the five methods we've studied, Hamilton's method is the only one that does not ever produce quota violations. This is a big pro for Hamilton's method, so why don't we use that one, right? Why did we go with Huntington Hill? So it turns out that Hamilton's method can produce some pretty funky results called paradoxes. The class activities will demonstrate each of them. So you'll walk through, as you work through the class activities, you'll be introduced to three interesting paradoxes that can happen with Hamilton's method. So here's a little bit of a summary. Um, of which of the five methods violate the quota rule, which of the five methods produce paradoxes, and whether they favor large states or small states. <clears throat> and it turns out, as you can kind of guess from the table there, that any apportionment, apportionment method that does not violate the quota rule will produce paradoxes, and any paradox-free method will violate the quota rule. And this is called um, Belinsky and Young's impossibility theorem. So it turns out that, just like with voting, there are no perfect solutions to the problem of apportionment. So here's a brief mnemonic to help you remember the five methods. Hamilton's method, there's always some extra ham to give out. Jefferson's method, that J kind of looks like an arrow pointing down. That's the round down method. Adam's method, the A looks like an arrow pointing up. That's the round up method. Webster's, we've got a W, it points both up and down, that's your conventional rounding. Huntington Hill, what the hill kind of rounding rule is that? That's crazy. That's the one with the geometric mean, and you get a slightly different cutoff value than 0.5. So finally, I just want to um, talk briefly about a current issue that we're dealing with. It's um, related to apportionment. Once the apportionment problem is solved, that is, we figured out how many votes is each state going to get um, in the Electoral College, another problem remains. How do those states award their electoral votes to the candidates? Right? They have so many votes to give out, how do they decide which candidate gets their votes? Most states give all of their votes to the winner of the popular vote in their state. So when you watch the election results coming in in an election year, they award, the state turns blue or red, right? Each state awards all of their votes to the winner of the popular vote from their state. There are two states, Nebraska and Maine, that split their electoral votes up. So they give one electoral vote to the winner of each congressional district and then the two remaining to the winner of the state popular vote. A large drawback of both of those, whether you give all, uh, winner takes all method or you split your votes, um, is that it's possible for a candidate to win the national popular vote, to have the most votes overall in the country, but still lose the electoral college and thus lose the election. This might sound familiar. Um, in response to this weakness, um, of the Electoral College system, 11 states, Rhode Island, Vermont, Hawaii, DC, Maryland, Massachusetts, and Washington, have passed laws that will award their electoral votes to the winner of the national popular vote instead of their state's popular vote. The new method won't go into effect for all any of those 11 states. The method doesn't go into effect until enough states have joined this group to bring its electoral vote total to 270. That's the magic number that you need to win the presidency, 270 electoral votes. So once enough states have joined that their electoral co college votes total 270, 
um, that will guarantee that the winner of the national popular vote will always win the Electoral College. All right, so you're going to um, move on to start your activities now, work through them. Um, these are important ones because it's going to introduce the three paradoxes that can come about with Hamilton's method. Work through them, check your answers as you go, and let me know if you have any questions.